to introduce a special guest sitting with us today, Ethel, Ethan Carpenter, who I met very soon after I moved here. Um, just, we had a great conversation about what this, what today was going to be about, and this song, while a little raucous, uh, I think it suits it well, and uh, Ethan knew it, and I knew him, and uh, they're going to back him up. Matthew 4, 
chapters 12 through 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee, and he left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Quote, land on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region in shadow of death light has dawned, unquote. And from that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebediah, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebediah, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed them. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. Thus end of the reading. Remember what it felt like the day after high school graduation? Free at last, but now what? Well, maybe at that point you were clear. Maybe you were well on track for more education or whatever. Maybe it was at the end of college when you stood there with your shiny new diploma in your hand. Now what do I do? Or when your kids left home, or when you retired, or, God forbid, maybe it hit you when you were in the middle of your busiest, most committed time of life, with uh, kids demanding things from you on one side and parents demanding on the other. Is this life? Is this, is this what it's about? Is this all there is? Really? There's something breathtaking in the story of those four fishermen who just laid down their nets and walked away, went with Jesus, leaving chaos at home, throwing their futures to the wind. Something they glimpsed in Jesus called to them so strongly that they just stepped out of all their other commitments and off they went. <coughs> Underneath every other need we've got is this need for a purpose, maybe for adventure, for trying something crazy on the wild chance that it leads to the place we were born to be. Some of us have been crazier than others across the years, but I bet we'll all know what it feels like to be discontented where we are. The feeling that we're stuck, that there's got to be more. With part of ourselves, we build the little empires we occupy, the homes and possessions, the family and friends, the careers and networks and reputations. We build and build and congratulate ourselves for being real grown-ups. Except that another part of us, given half a chance, would walk away from all of it. And sometimes people do. One person who did is a guy named Graham Mole, Scottish, a little younger than me. He grew up in Glasgow. As a boy, he was creative in various ways. He would make up plays and invite his friends to, to be in plays with him. <coughs> uh, he started a band with his, his brother and his sister called He, She, and It. His little brother was the it. <laughs> he was good at school, but not inspired by school, except there was an art teacher who believed in him, saw some talent in him, and encouraged him in his dream of going to architecture school. So he did, and he went to school, and he did all the coursework, and was nearly through the apprenticeship that would qualify him as an architect when he decided to walk away from all of it. What had happened was that one miserable wet night, if you've ever been to Glasgow, you can picture it, he and a buddy attended a meeting for people from 150 different churches across the region, Church of Scotland churches. These were people who were involved in youth work. Only five people turned up. The leader, a guy by the name of John Bell, had set up 100 chairs for the crowd that he'd anticipated. So when nobody came, he asked these three uh, strapping young men whether they would help him take all the chairs down. 
And when they finished that, he said, would you like to go out for a drink? Well, three pubs refused to serve them because Graham Mull, although he was 23, looked like not a day over 16. So they ended up standing on a corner in the pouring rain, talking. John Bell left the encounter that night saying that he felt he had just met one of the most important people of his life. A week later, Graham phoned him. Would it be okay? Could I volunteer in that youth club you told us about, the one in Calton? think inner city. And six months after that, when he was just weeks away from finishing his architecture qualification, Graham quit to become resident youth leader in a kind of halfway house in one of the toughest areas of the city. His family was appalled, his professors despaired. Every Monday, the three of them would get together, he and John and another guy who would join them, a guy from South Africa, actually. They would get together and they would share a case study, maybe a story of one of the young people they were working with. But one Monday, they took their story from the Bible, David and Goliath. King Saul gave David his own armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped the king's sword over the armor and he tried to walk, but he couldn't. He said to Saul, I'm not used to these. So he removed them, and he picked up five smooth stones. Reading the story that day, the three young men had a revelation that the point of the story wasn't the bravery of David, the way we usually tell it, but the foolishness of an adult world that tries to saddle the next generation with tools that haven't even worked for them. So they redoubled their efforts to reach out to the troubled teenagers of that challenging community with a whole new and fresh kind of Christian faith. I share that story for three reasons. The first is that we're connected to Graham Moore. I've never met him, but with that friend of his, John Bell, he is the writer of the song that we sang at the beginning of our service, Will You Come and Follow Me? Also, the song that the choir sang to open our worship last Sunday, Take This Moment, Sign and Space, Take My Friends Around and our first hymn the week before, Christ makes with his friends a touching place. And the song we sang all through December, before the world began, one word was there, rooted in God he was, rooted in care. By him all things were made, in him was love displayed, through him God spoke and said, I am for you. I didn't plan to program all those songs. They were just what came to mind. Jeff and I get together, we think about these things and let inspiration move us. The second reason for telling the story is that I learned just a couple of days ago that Graham Moll died um, after Christmas, age 61. <laughs> they had a wonderful service for him. I've seen the bulletin, all the wonderful songs that he'd written, and the ones that we've sung and a host more besides. I never met him but I feel the loss. And the third reason you probably guessed is that uh, I came across Graham Mole's story as I was pondering about those four fishermen dumping their nets and walking out on the, the life track that they had laid out in front of them. The parallel really struck me. The student three months away from his qualification as an architect who got up and walked away because there was something in the spirit of that youth work that grabbed him, heart and mind and soul. It was where he had to be. And because of that one decision, he ended up touching thousands, tens of thousands of lives, including us, all these miles away. Which leads to a fourth reason. Uh, the work developed beyond that youth project in that one place. It found a home in the Iona community, which is one of the most exciting expressions of Christian witness in our time, with its fabulous worship and its commitment to justice. This is just a teeny detail, but when Dale and I took our youth groups to Iona, it's many years ago now, we stayed in a place called the McLeod Center. Architect Graham Moore, he finished his architecture training 
It took 30 years, but he ended up with a PhD in the intersection between architecture and spirituality, which casts for me a whole new light on the business of walking away from your nets. <laughs> what you lay down waits dormant until the day when you need it again, when maybe it all gets put back together in a combination that will represent your unique contribution to the human race. Um, like Ethan saying, I gotta find me, doesn't in some ways strike a Christian chord because we're gonna be always for other people or something, but there is that me in there, you know. You know when you're home, you know when you're sailing true north, you know when you're, when you're engaged in work that you were born to do. It's no mistake that Jesus promised a group of fishermen that they would fish for people. Um, today we puzzle over what that means, but I bet they knew. The story that Casey read for us finishes with broad brushstrokes about what happened next, a ministry that was different every day, teaching in synagogues, preaching in town squares and, and the countryside all around, healing disease. We could add going to dinner with tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees, defying barriers, tending to brokenness, creating a new kind of community, telling stories, hearing confessions, facing opposition. It makes me think that if our purpose lies in discovering the one thing that we are meant to do, it also lies in bringing the Christ Spirit with us into everything we do. Our vocation may be one big step at one particular point in our lives, but it's also a million everyday steps where our gladness meets the hunger of the world. You lay down your nets, you step into the unknown, you quit architecture school and move into a youth halfway house in the slums. And then the next day you get up and you do a lot of the things that ordinary people do. So, day by day, we all strive to see God more clearly, and love more God more dearly, and follow God more nearly. And the end, is a unique mixture of experiences and a unique take on the world, a unique constellation of gifts and skills that end up touching the world in a way that nobody else could do. Andrew and Peter, James and John, they're held up for us as heroes. That first step, that was the hardest one. But you know that, you know what? I think about it, I think, I bet it wasn't that hard. <laughs> And body and mind and soul, you're waiting to say yes to something. Maybe waiting to say yes to the one who made you, the one who entices you with the promise of eternal life. We are made for that yes. Nothing else satisfies. And after that, we have the choice to make yes a habit every day for the rest of our lives. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Lord, your summons echoes true when you would call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you, and you in me. Amen. In joyful response to our calling, loving, living God, your gifts will be received.